We're all on the journey to eternity. Our goal is heaven. And we can be absolutely 100% certain we're going to get there if we place our faith in Jesus to get us there. And today we're going to learn about that. We're going to learn about that this very day. Well, the title of my message today is Just Believe. Just Believe. John is the gospel of belief. The gospel of John. It is the gospel of belief in the New Testament. The word believe is found seven times in the book of Matthew, five times in the book of Mark. In the book of Luke, it is found 11 times in the book of Mark, five times in the book of Luke, and 46 times in the book of John. John is the gospel of belief. Now there's a reason for this. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a specific focus, a common theme, and that is declaring the words and the works of Jesus. Focusing on what Jesus did and what he said. John, on the other hand, has a different focus. John calls his readers to place their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In fact, he says that specifically in John 20, verse 30 and 31. Listen to what he says. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, all these signs in the book of John, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. John wrote his book that men, women, and boys and girls might come to faith in Jesus Christ and be saved. Now, this way of salvation, this believing unto salvation, cuts across the grain of just about everybody in the world except Christians. In fact, most who even claim to be Christians don't really understand this. Every other major religion in the world denies that you can be saved only by faith in Christ. I was on a Mormon website this week. It's interesting what the Mormons will tell you. They will tell you that they are saved by belief in Christ, but they say that God puts conditions on how we must access salvation. And it's kind of a bunch of mumbly jumbly stuff if you want all the truth. But here's what one Mormon blogger said that good works meet a condition upon which the reception of Christ's gift is predicated. Now that, that just simply means God will give you the free gift of salvation, but you've got to meet some conditions on the front end. So it's really not free. Not free at all. Brigham Young was one of their founders. He put it more plainly. Here's what he said. Keeping the commandments of God will cleanse away the stain of sin. Keeping the commandments. John says, no, Brigham Young, you're not right. It is not the commandments that you keep that will save you from your sins. Only belief, only belief, faith in Jesus will justify you from your sins. Now, today we're going to learn about a guy who believed and found out that was all it took. And his whole family believed. And that's all it took. We're going to find out about him. So if you will, turn your Bibles to John chapter 4. We're going to read about it. And I pray to God that today you're believing Jesus Christ will change your life. John chapter 4. Follow with me as I read. I'm going to begin reading in verse 4. I'm sorry, in verse 46. John chapter 4, verse 46. So follow with me as I read. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea and Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. And the nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. Now as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, Say, Your son lives. And he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And himself believed, and his whole household. This again 
is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. This was the second visit that Jesus had made to Cana in the last several weeks or maybe a few months. On his first visit, he gave a physical blessing. He turned water into wine. On this visit, he added water. He gave a physical blessing and a spiritual blessing to go with it. But here's what I want you to see about this today. That is, everywhere Jesus went, Jesus left a blessing. Everywhere he went. The first blessing he left, he left was in Canaan when he turned water into wine. And then the Bible tells us that he took a trip up to Judea, to Jerusalem, to the Passover feast. And there the Bible says in John 2, he did many miracles and many believed on him. At least they said they believed on him, but they really didn't. But he did many miracles. He blessed people when he was in Jerusalem. And then the Bible says that he had to go to uh, he had to go back down to Galilee. But you remember we talked about the woman at the well. He needed to go through Samaria. And he blessed that woman at Samaria with a blessing of living water. And then he blessed all those men of Sychar with the living water. And then he came on back down to Cana and he gave this noble blessing. And he blessed that son by healing him. Listen, everywhere Jesus went, he blessed people. But that was just what Jesus did. That was who he was. Acts chapter 10, 38 says that Jesus went about doing good. He always blessed folks wherever he went. Now there's an obvious lesson here. And that is, listen, if you're a believer in Jesus, we are to follow his example. We're to bless people everywhere we go. Every encounter. So did you know that every time you leave your house every morning, you have a chance to bless somebody, no matter where you go, if you're a believer in Jesus. Every, even casual contact with somebody, you bless them if you just ask God to give you an opportunity. You bless most everybody you meet. Heaven knows, heaven knows how many angry, disgruntled, uncaring customers that cashiers have to deal with every day. Anybody ever been a cashier at a grocery store? That, can I get an amen, sister? Amen. Now, folks just come in mad, upset, and they take it out on cashiers. They do. And, and, and just, but how many of them have ever heard the words of somebody that left the cashier go out the door, have a blessed day? I guarantee you, not many people knew that. But it blesses them when somebody just smiles at them and says, have a blessed day. How many times has a couple of ever heard at, on the job, you say, or another Christian, hey, in my prayer time tonight, anything I can pray about for you? <coughs> Listen, that blow somebody's socks off if you told them that that's tomorrow. But you know, they are blessed by things like that. Listen, if you purpose wherever you go, just say, God, make me a blessing, you mark it down, God will make you a blessing and a difference maker in somebody's life. <coughs> just last night, Janice and I had this opportunity. We can, if we do, when we go out to eat, try to be a blessing to our waitress or waiter. And if, uh, if, we're, if we're able to do it, which most times we can, as they serve our food, we'll just say to them, hey, we're about to pray over our meal. We're Christians. Can we pray about anything for you? And uh, by the way, I hope that when you eat out, you pray for us. Uh, don't be hypocrite. Don't pray over your meal at your home and then not pray in public. That is a good witness. It is. So we do that. We pray. We pray. And so every time we, get, we try to do that. So last night we were eating pizza somewhere and, and wait, waitress came and we asked her, can we pray for you from that new thing? And within less than five seconds, that waitress began to leave. And, and, and but, 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 but a big smile came on her face. And she said, Oh, I'm so thankful. I'm so happy you asked me that. Thank you for praying for me. And she was so overwhelmed that we would just pray for her. And so she stood right there. If I remember correctly, uh, I, I, I grabbed her hand. Um, and, and, and we just we just prayed. We prayed for her. And she was so thankful. And you know, uh, that didn't happen much, really. It happened a few times. But it happens. You can be a difference if you just ask God to make 
Jesus was a difference. He made a difference everywhere he went. And he lives in you. And you can make the same difference if you are filled with his spirit and obey him. Make a difference. Make a difference. Well, let me tell you what happens when you make a difference. You make a difference. The world will get out you make a difference. And people will come flocking to you. You make a difference in their life. And that's what they did with Jesus. Word got out that Jesus was back in Cana. And this nobleman who was in Capernaum heard the word. And he hit it to Cana as fast as he could get there. You see, it was 20 miles, 20 miles over there, but he had a desperate need. He had a life and death need. His son was about to die, and he had to get to Jesus as fast as he could. And he did. Now, there's something else we learn at this point about truth, about life. Now, friends, listen. When trouble comes, it doesn't matter who you are, how much money you have, you're all down on the same level play field. That nobleman, by the way, the word nobleman in the, in the original language, that means belonging to a king. Belonging, belonging to a king. This guy was a, a servant in the court of the king. And most people think it was Herod Antipatus, who was the king of Palestine during that day. He was a big dude. He had a lot of authority. He had a lot of money. But let me tell you, when his son got sick, he was just like everybody else. And listen, friends, let me tell you, that's the reason that you need to know Jesus in your life right now. Because I don't care how powerful you are, how much authority you have, <coughs> how strong you think you are, when troubles come, you're right down there with the rest of us. And you need something bigger than you to bring you through. And only Jesus Christ can do it. This man was broken. No matter how powerful he was, he was broken because of the need of his life. And he ran to Jesus. And the Bible says in verse 47, he implored Jesus. That word means to beg. And the tense of the verb is continuous. He kept on begging and kept on begging. Pleading with Jesus, heal my son, heal my son. May I say to you, there are a lot of people who don't believe that God answers prayer. And the reason they don't is because He doesn't answer their prayers. So they don't believe He answers anybody's prayers. But the reason He doesn't answer their prayers is because they don't really pray earnestly like this guy did. They put a little now and then, loud, lay me down to sleep prayer at night, or, or just a little prayer over the meal, and that's about it. And they never see God do anything. Listen, this guy was begging. He was serious. You know what the Bible says about prayer? It says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I want to ask you something. When's the last time you have effectually, fervently called out to God for an answer, for a need in your life, or even somebody else's life? When's the last time? If it's been a long while, that may be the reason you don't get any answers. Now, Jesus told the story in Matthew 18 about fervent prayer. He gave a parable about, about a, 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 a widow who had, a, had an oppressor, an adversary. And he was doing something to this woman, and she needed to be relieved of all her oppression. And she went to this unjust judge who did not fear God nor man. And, and the unjust judge just said, get away. Don't hear it. But she wouldn't take no for an answer. The Bible says she kept on and kept on and kept on pestering that judge until he finally said, look, I don't fear God. I don't fear man. But to get this woman off my back, I'm going to answer her request. And he answered her request. And God says, listen, if this unjust judge will do such a thing, how much more will God answer the prayers of his own elect, his own children? Keep on praying. Earnestly pray. And God will hear your prayers. He will hear your prayers. Do you need a healing today? You might, you might need a physical healing now, may I say this? It may or may not be God's will to heal you, but He may be waiting on you to fervently pray for healing. Do you, does your marriage need to be healed? Does a relationship, a friendship need to be healed? Does, does an emotional issue with you, do, do, do you just need a, an emotional healing? Do you need some sin that you want? So, I'm going to tell you, friends, whatever's going on in your life, when you pray, Hey, you've got a better guarantee than this Noah. You say he didn't know for sure Jesus was going to heal answer his prayer. But here's what God says to you in Jeremiah 29. You will seek me and you will find me if you search for me with all your heart. You search for God, you seek him, you'll find him and you'll get your answer. 
But I want to ask every parent and every grandparent here a question, if I may, at this point. If you have a child or a grandchild who is not saved, how earnestly do you pray for them? Let me tell you something. If you have a child or a grandchild who's old enough to know right from wrong, and they have never trusted Christ as their personal Savior, they're in a whole lot worse shape than this noble son who is about to die. Because you see, he's about to have a physical death. But if you have a child or a grandchild who knows right from wrong, never been saved, they are already spiritually dead. And if they die physically, they're going to spend eternity in hell. And God forbid you should not earnestly pray for the salvation of your children and your grandchildren. Listen, you ought to be on your knees night and day, uh, physically if you can, and if not, in your mind, because they're lost and need to be saved. And I beg you, pray for your kids. Pray for your grandkids. There's not a day that passes. I do not pray for my grandchildren to be saved. Thank God my children are saved. But I've got a bunch of grandchildren that are not. And I'm praying they will be. They need to be saved. I want you to notice what Jesus responded to this guy. His first response was to this guy when he prayed. He said, Lord, come heal my son. He's about to die. Look what Jesus said to him in verse 48. Look what he said. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Now that's a strange thing to say to a guy who's asking someone for a healing. What did Jesus mean by that? What did he mean by that? Well, I'll tell you what he's doing. Listen, he was exposing the attitude of this man, the attitude of so many others around him, and the attitude of so many people today. Their attitude toward Jesus, toward God. Now what is that attitude? What is the attitude Jesus was exposing? Here's what it was. Here's what many people say to Jesus when he calls them for a response to follow him. He says, take up your cross and follow me. You know what people say to Jesus? They say this. Jesus I can handle things pretty much right now. Things are going pretty good. But if things get tough and I can't handle it, then I'll look you up. That's the way most people treat Jesus. May I say to you, that's a sorry attitude. And I hope that's not how you treat Jesus. Now I believe most of you are believers in Christ. You've been saved. Let me tell you, sometimes us believers can treat Jesus about the same way lost people do. We can say, Jesus, I'm living my life. I'm doing well. And I need you. I'll look you up. God help us not to have such a sorry attitude. But that's the way many people live their lives. And that's exactly what the nobleman did. You see, when Jesus told him this, it didn't even convict him one eye over. All he did was go right back and ask Jesus again. He just ignored what Jesus said. He just asked him again, heal my son. But now we see the grace of God kick in in an amazing way. Even though this man was so disconcerned about his own soul, he had one thing on his mind. Jesus, in his grace, answered the man's request. And he healed his son. He healed him despite the man's disregard for Christ. Now, let me ask you, just what if? What if when the man said, Jesus, heal my son, what if Jesus had said, now, wait a minute, buddy. Uh, you've got your priorities out of order. You've got a spiritual need of your own life for you to talk about. Then we'll talk about your son. What if Jesus had said that? I'm telling you, that man would have walked away bitter and may have never been saved. But Jesus knew where he was. He knew he wasn't ready to hear the gospel. And he met a need in his life that had to be met before he could even open himself up to be saved. That's what Jesus did. Listen, here's what the Bible says. Luke 19, 10. Jesus came to seek and to save that which lost. Jesus is seeking lost sinners, and he'll seek them in different ways. Everybody's different. What do you do with Nicodemus? He got straight to the point. He said that, he, I mean, he, he cut to the chest. Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. With a woman at the well, he presented the living water. And he said, woman, here it is. She said, I want it. And she got it on the spot. But this man was different. He was not ready. And Jesus knew it. And Jesus graciously met his physical need 
so later he can meet his spiritual need. Now, I want you to notice a great example of faith here we can all learn from. Notice what this man said. Look, if you will, again in verse 50. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. Now look, now the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went his way. Now, he didn't have any physical evidence. He didn't, he couldn't obviously see all the way down the road 20 miles. He didn't know. All he had was the word of Jesus. But he said he believed Jesus and went his way. What an example of faith. Let me tell you something. There will be times in your life when you'll be praying and the Holy Spirit of God will give you an answer. And God will say, I don't do this. I'm hearing your prayers. Go your way. Now, that's happened a couple of times in my life. Now, it ain't willing your life from time to time if you're a believer. What you going to do with that? I'll tell you what you ought to do. Just like you ought to do like this man said. Believe what Jesus said. And go your way and rejoice in what God done for you. Now, you can either do that and rejoice, or you can doubt Jesus, and you can worry and fret, and you can be miserable. It's up to you. But God wants you to be happy. When He gives you an answer, rejoice and go your way and give God the glory, like this guy did. That's what He wants you to do. That's what He wants you to do. Well, let me say, you can't believe Him. He's never, ever, ever not come through with one promise. Listen, if Jesus ever didn't keep His word, you couldn't trust anything He said. Might as well throw out the Bible. And try to find salvation somewhere else. He has always kept his word. He'll keep it with you. Believe what he said and be blessed. Believe what he said and be blessed. Now, I want you to notice what happened the very next day after the man believed Jesus. Look what it says again. I want you to look at verse 51. Now he was going down. This is the next day. He was almost home. He was going down. And his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when it got better. And they said that the seventh hour, the fever left him. And the father knew that it was the same hour which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. Here's what happened. His servants met him on his way home. And he almost got home. And he met him, and they said, hey, your son's alive. And so he said, what time did he get healed? And he put it all together when they said the seventh hour. And that was exactly the time that Jesus said it. And he said, hey, man, this guy is who he said he was. And he says he believed. He believed again. He believed once the day he got, his boy got healed, he believed the next day. But it was different. This time, he believed in the salvation. He was born again. He believed Jesus was the Messiah. He got saved. And not only him, but his whole household believed. They all became children of God. Because God was patient. He took the time to meet the physical need so it could meet that spiritual need that's most important. Oh, how merciful and how gracious God is to do whatever it takes to bring us to himself. I have a friend named Tom Sales. A dear friend who is in my former church. Tom visits here occasionally. Some of you might have met him. And I share Tom's story with his permission. Tom was a very successful, uh, had a very successful career with the Veterans Administration. Um, and in several places, just rose, climbed the ladder, and made a lot of money. Finally retired, and came back to Foster's, uh, and retired there. Um, and so, living a good life, 67, 68 years old, good retirement coming in, all was well with Tom. Tom had an adult son who lived with him and his wife. And one day, Tom's good life came crashing down in an instant. When his son, Ben, took a pistol to his own head in Tom's kitchen and committed suicide right before Tom's eyes. Tom told me later, he did not sleep for a whole month. I did not know Tom at the time. But a member of our church knew his wife. And she told me, Mike, this man's son committed suicide. You need to go visit him. And so two or three days after the suicide, I went to visit Tom Sales. 
And then what can you say when a man's son had just committed suicide right before his eyes? There was not much I could say. I just said, Tom, all I can tell you is that God loves you. We'll be praying for you. We love you. And uh, come to church. If you feel like coming, come to church. You know what? The very next Sunday, Tom was in church. He came to the back doors of Grants Creek Baptist Church and sat down right back in the back. It had probably been years since Tom had been in church and maybe never in a Baptist church. Tom was raised Catholic. Probably never been in a Baptist church his whole life, but he came in and sat there and he wept the entire service. He came back the next Sunday, sat there, and wept the entire service. I went to visit Tom and uh, just tried to encourage him. And he kept coming back every Sunday to sit there and weep. This happened for weeks and weeks. And after about the third or fourth week, I went to share the gospel because Tom was not a Christian. And, and I knew that. He did not have the peace of Jesus in his heart. And I, and, I, and, I, and I took out the word and I said, Tom, Jesus wants to save you. He said, I'm not ready. He's not ready. I'm sorry. I'm not ready. But he continued to come to church. He never missed a Sunday. And I would go and try to encourage him from time to time. But one day, about four months after his son committed suicide, I got a call. And Tom said, Brother Mike, I'm ready. Can you come to my house? And so I drove straight over to Tom's house. When I got there, he pulled out a piece of paper that he had written, Born to Jesus on. It was the most precious thing I had read in my whole life. And in that point, he confessed to Jesus his need for forgiveness and his need for healing. And he cried out to Jesus to come into my life and change my life and save me. And it was the most precious thing. And we got our gifts right there. Tom prayed to receive Christ. But I am certain he was a true Christian before I got there. Because God saw his heart. And God saw his need and God met his need. And here's the point. He wasn't ready. He was not ready when his son committed suicide. It took him four long months. But when he was ready, Jesus was there. But the people of God at Grants Creek embraced Tom and loved him and drew him in patiently until Jesus, he could receive Jesus as his Savior. Oh, God is so patient. He was patient with his nobleman. He's patient with you today. Some of you have been struggling for no telling how long with issues in your life. And maybe you've not been ready to receive Christ. But today, God is speaking to you and you know you're ready and He is calling you to receive Him. And, and, and just like this nobleman, the Bible says he simply believed. You know what Tom did that day? He just believed. Listen, he was 68 years old. He knew he had lived a life full of sin. There was nothing he could do to, to ask God for any, 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 any favor. He just said, Lord, I'm a sinner. We're all just sinners. All we can do is cry out for mercy. And just like Tom cried out and said, I believe Jesus. I give myself fully to you. Just like that. Let me tell you, some of you may have done that for a minute. There's others who are a child of God. We need to believe, we need to be believing God for something in our own lives as Christians. I'm going to tell you, friends, it's one thing to be saved by faith. But it's quite another to live by faith day by day. Let me tell you, the life of belief starts when you are born again, but it continues until the day you die. May I ask you, dear child of God, are you walking by faith? Are you believing God for miracles in your life today? Oh, I hope you are. Because if you're not, you're missing out, and so many others are missing out as well, because they're missing out in the power of God in your life to change a life. What Jesus called you to do today. He's calling you to believe so. And we believe. We need to walk by him in that way. Let's pray. Just a moment. We're going to sing in your invitation. It's number 433. I surrender all. The call today is first of all, you do not know Jesus Christ. To come to him and say, I believe in Jesus. I believe I need you and you alone. You're the only person that can wash my sins away. Please, Jesus, make me your child. I'm ready to submit my full life to you, to take full control. I 
Turn for a box in and turn. 